Welcome. Guys, gals, and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary, and feminist perspective. My name is Joel, I'm one of your hosts, and with me, as always, is your other juiced up host. Brian, hi. Welcome, 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 Brian, to this season finale of both Buffy and Buffy Boys. <laughs> True. Um, I sometimes worry that people will think that my name is Brian High. <laughs> uh, I have the whole kind of um, slightly Phoebe Buffay husky voice thing going on today as well, I think. A little bit, can you hear that? Uh, a little bit. I mean, you know, we'll see how it comes out in the recording. Hopefully it's better than last week's recording, which uh, I fucked up. Annie, anyway. Can you auto-tune me? Is that a thing you can do? Um, I cannot auto-tune you. I do not have the skills. So, do you want to buff me on Please, yeah. So we're going to go um, straight into the Buffy and summary. I'm not sure why I said that. Go ahead. We always do. So this is season six, episode 22, Grave. It is. It was first aired on May 21st, 2002. It was directed by James A. Contner, who last directed Entropy. It was written by David Fury, who last wrote Gone. And um, here is your Buffy and summary. Uh, the pages all fall out of my book as soon as I open it, which is great. Buffy confides... The season's events to Giles, who giggles, bound Willow enthralls Anya into freeing her and drains Giles of given co- coven-given power. She shoots a fireball after Xander and the others. Buffy outruns it. Willow casts Buffy and Dawn into a pit to fight demons. Okay, no, she doesn't. Dawn impresses Buffy. Willow tries to end the world in its sadness. Xander talks her down, aided by the good magic Willow was tricked into stealing from Giles. Spike gets his soul back. Cool. Um, I was really struck, Joe, by what you said last week about how, like, the Spike stuff is, like, one scene stretched over three episodes. Yeah. Like, it's really, like, there's nothing to it, really, until the very end of this episode. Like, if you put that entire um, sequence in Africa in one episode, it would constitute, you know, a mildly interesting scene. Yeah. 100%. Um, so, yeah. Uh, how did you find this episode, Joe? Yeah, so we're going. I, I think I think we should call it probably that we're going to go straight into the. Oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna skip the bronze banner this week, which is a real shame because I want to talk about uh, Berserk. Yeah, so we'll, we'll 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 come to Berserk I think in our next episode, which is a um, manga a, and anime, a manga and anime uh, uh, from the nineties. Uh, which actually, um, if you're interested in it at all, we'll talk about this later next week. But if you're interested in all, go watch um, a YouTube video by. A very lovely uh, trans woman called L- Lady Emily, I think, or yes, Lady her, Emily yeah. is her YouTube name. Who I know because she is a co-writer with um, Sarah Z, or sorry, Sarah Z, probably, who um, is a just a Canadian YouTuber who does a lot of like fandom nonsense, Tumblr nonsense stuff, which I find deeply enjoyable. But she did a like a, an hour and a half video on the different um, uh, different adaptations of berserk the manga over the years and it's just it was, it was a good watch i think you should i think you should watch it if you have an hour and a half to watch a video essay which yeah I, which i always do or you can watch it faster um but yeah so we started watching that this week and it, it inspired a number of things that we are big fans of and it also inspired you to google how to read manga on tablet <laughs> so True. i think it's worth going into depth as we kind of get further into it but no this week um in our season finale we're going to go straight into talking about the uh season uh, closer of uh season six of buffy uh, and also the season uh, as a whole um so yeah um how do i find the episode i felt that it is um it was one of the more enjoyable um episodes of this kind of the actual sequence. arc definitely the sequence i think it's probably my second favorite of the sequence of three um, the one where she kills Warren is a kind of a, just a tighter, clearer story. Mm-hmm. But this also, by virtue of being the season finale, just felt like you know the, the season has kind of had a little bit of kind of like um, like stasis to it at times, like kind of yeah. like, or, or like a, like loading, kind of bu- buffering rather might be a better way to put it. And at least in this episode, it felt like things could come to a conclusion, so that was satisfying. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed watching it. Um, I think it is. And it's an interesting it's an interesting exercise as a season finale um but i think it is also um, belaying entirely with just deus ex machina and contrived um situations and all that yeah um it's entire its entire motivation uh, aside from like a cool a couple of cool sequences is is to create situations to resolve pre-existing personal storylines yeah it um it for me smacks of the other uh finale that Joss Whedon didn't write which is the finale to season four's 
main storyline, mm-hmm. i.e. not restless, uh, which was called uh, Primal? Primeval. Primeval, um, which I think is a very similar kind of thing going forward to this one where it's like, oh, the actual solution is like reasonably uh, out of the blue and kind of meaningless. The There's good stuff about it, but it doesn't feel quite like a conclusive thing. And I think if we take this season and season seven as being a two-hander, I think it kind of like excuses it a little bit. But definitely, this is by far the weakest finale of any Buffy season, without a doubt. Yeah, and there's a, I, I kind of I remember I remember watching it when it aired. I think would that oh, make cool. sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't watch this one when it aired because at this point it wasn't airing on whatever. Yeah, show, if I not had. when it aired, like when 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 I first aired on Irish TV or when I first watched mm-hmm, it but mm-hmm. back in the day, and just being like. Thinking at the time that the whole stuff with how she went from, you know, where she was to wanting to end the world seemed really like, I feel like I'd misc something. And yeah. I still feel that on this. I think that the whole, I'd like, there's a certain element of we, with like Buffy as a show always has um, a certain MacGuffin of ending the world. Like, why really does Angelus like use the Acathalus statue and they bug everything, eat the world, etc. But this thing of like just raising a temple uh, yeah. in the middle, like uh, up on Kingsman Bluff. Uh, and the effort that went into doing that, I didn't even come off very well. You know, I, yeah. I don't know. It's just, I, it's almost what, like, what did she it? have to, dig, dig, dig Dark Willow? Yeah. Have to want to end the world? Is that the only stakes that she could have had, if you know what I mean? No, I totally agree. So, a couple of things there. One is that apparently the um, the budget for this episode or was just like less than you would expect because a huge amount of the budget for the season went to Once More With Feeling, which you can mm. really see. I mean, like, yeah. unfortunately, you can kind of see the last two episodes, they're clearly running out of budget by this point. They're just, they don't have the CGI budget, they don't have anything. We noticed there's a couple of points where you can just see, um, like, ropes pulling up, st- like, the, the satanic temple mm. and holding it back. And, you know, there's also a point, of course, where, incredible moment, where <laughs> yeah. uh, Xander is staring into the hole with Anya, with Xander, sorry, with Don and Buffy, and someone has grabbed his trousers and are, is just pulling his underwear back, yeah, basically, so, to stop him from falling in. Exactly. So there's a Which bit. I don't think was probably visible for the, uh, for the, 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 the kind of the broadcast. The fourth broadcast, yeah. yeah. Which, to, yeah, absolutely, to be fair. I uh, always give that um, credence to it. But uh, yeah, the bit is and there's like nearly slips into the hole and you can see a stage hand like fully just like pull his, pull his ass out basically yeah. while like, pulling Nicholas Brennan back from the edge. I wonder if it was a stuntman because otherwise that is just Nicholas Brennan's like like ass like hanging out entirely. Yeah, yeah well, I, I have to think it wasn't a stuntman because it's not actually a stunt because the hole isn't there. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. they're not actually, this, and this is something I never understood when I was watching TV when I was younger. They're not actually down in a hole. You know, like there's somewhere they're standing and looking up, sure, but like it's not in the same location. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um but no. Um but no and what I'd say is yeah, so let's get into the meat of it. The Dark Willow thing. I love the concept of Dark Willow. I love how they do Dark Willow in um not seeing red the next episode, which is villains. Um where she is becoming a villain and she is toying with a part of her own personality and her own experience, which is subsumed by grief and aggression and letting all that out incredible when you take you know a part of willow which has already always existed and like extrapolating an extreme darkness out of Mm. that as a reaction to a deeply traumatic situation that's fascinating writing when you get to the episode 21 and 22 you kind of more feel like the conversation there is not about willow it's about what the magic she accidentally consumed Mm. and how she is now like uh, influenced by this dark magic to kind of go far beyond anything she'd ever do and it's like well that's not interesting you know i mean like what if like in this episode what if the stakes was willow attempting to kill one of her friends to get to uh andrew and jonathan and that was the emotional Thing, you know like willow attempting to kill one of her own friends and actually emphasizing that whereas she does it multiple times in, in these yeah. episodes kind of like just like off the bat but imagine if like you actually had willow written proper written grieving and angry and over gone past the edge what if you wrote her in this episode having her moral quandary not be the end of the world but instead be to get to those you have to go through buffy you have to go through yeah like giles or someone and that being the the whole thing that potentially breaks her, that's and being able to talk, be, having her talked down from 
from like you know not murdering one of her friends that would have been great writing if they had put the emphasis on that instead it's like well we need to go bigger and more bombastic and it gets it gets lost yeah no i I agree with you 100 percent. i think you can imply that if she doesn't stop she will eventually go to something much worse but i think you what you do what i wanted from this was it for it to get smaller and more Mm -hmm. like not the boggy but in the same way that that, that, like it can be just as jarring to go very small as it can be to go very big you know to just it's it's one of the it's one of the most interesting things about the season is that it's such a dark season in so many ways but not a moment of it ever reached the actual despair of the body yeah see the 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 there are absolutely parts of um, Willow's arc with Tara that like uh, applying and present actual grief and actual yeah. trauma. And generally, I find that works best when uh, Giles, Buffy, or Dong are interacting with Willow. Like those, the acting performances there kind of like, and the fact that they have shared experience and trauma, all that I think mm-hmm. really helps. But uh, in, it, as it goes on, and as Willow doesn't actually do anything and uh, nearly as graphic or drastic is what she did to Warren from that point on it becomes a little tea for teens yeah like they have to communicate her and again maybe it's because it's kind of show it is and the the network is on raging and all that but like if that was if this if this kind of arc was made today in like a hbo show she would go from what she did to Warren to like injuring and hurting and torturing people more progressively mm-hmm. but with this she just keeps saying ass a lot or bitch you yeah. know yeah, yeah. uh or like you know, just like sassy, kind of weird, kind of like central bank kind well, of they darkness. Wanted the, they yeah. wanted the best of both worlds, where they got to have their dark Willow character written, all dark and moody and shit. Um, but they also wanted her to have an excuse as to why she was doing it. It was like, just do one or the other. You know, if she's if yeah. she has, in a moment of extreme grief, taken this magic onto herself, and she has now become a vessel for something dark and fucked, and she's no longer in control do that that's interesting you put the put the scoobies in a situation where they have to potentially destroy willow to get rid of this world threatening um demon inside her kind of thing mm. but instead doing this blended version where it's willow but it's not you know it's it's just lesser and there's there's aspects of it now i don't think it is derivative but there's aspects of it which is just reflection of the season two finale which yeah. is you have someone who is beloved to you who is kind of being consumed or infected by this dark thing and you have to stop them to stop the end of the world but like it's not as well thought out as that yeah yeah and like you know if you put that like you know uh that reverse thing where you in season two where like like let's say if oh god okay like we're not just doing you know the we are buffy's writer's room uh boys but there's a fan fiction is what we're doing right here let's do some fan fiction so imagine if you actually properly built this season to reflect season two where Buffy's major um major issue in this season is in season two where she had to kill a like you know the the man she loves to to stop the world from ending in this episode you have like her trying to not be killed by her absolute best friend you know like where you you have that kind of like same tension and aggression Mm -hmm. and sadness and and Willow's Buffy, tra- like, I mean, and b- both Buffy and Willow trying to figure out what mm. they are afterwards and stuff, rather than this kind of like light-handed stuff. Yeah, and maybe something more about how Willow has to go through Buffy to achieve what she wants to achieve, but Buffy is finally wants to live in which yeah. she, way she has not for the start of the season. So I well, think that's a, that's a great point. That would have been that would have been great writing. I mean, like, what if Willow says, "Buffy, I'm, I'll give you what you wanted. You wanted to yeah. die," and Buffy says, "Like, like, 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 sees Dawn or something," in the, or and says no yeah. and like fights for both of their lives essentially great and that like, would be great all like all a lot of that is in the episode like like willow does say you know i took you out of the earth and the earth wants you back and all that kind of stuff it's all there it's just like they there, there's a there's an element of of hesitancy of you know i i, I think i wonder if at this point being so aware of the fang um gaze on the show mm-hmm. um in in some in some aspects i think maybe its teeth are a little blunted because like you make either of these decisions you make willow do something that arguably she can't um hang wave or come back from easily um you risk alienating people Mm -hmm. a little bit and and, you know good character work and, and, and and challenging stories are not 
performatively controversial, but they, they're inherently divisive. Like, you're yeah. falling one way or the other, you know? Yeah, it's a funny one as well, because I think, like, there are so many elements of this episode which, yeah, you're right, do suffer from being um, fan-influenced because it is a remix of so many fan-favorite uh, like, elements of the show. You know, Dark Willow and Vamp Willow being... Or Vamp Willow being, like, a massive, massive brilliant moment in, yeah. in Buffy where the, to the point where they brought her back because she was yeah. so good or even just the concept of our allies turning out to be you know these yep. darker mirror versions of themselves yep yeah. yep um or just like you know emotionally talking someone to to to, to forgiveness um the like you know, the um the, the apocalypse element of it like all these things feel like you could have just not like yeah. done no, taken those approaches it been I, good Absolutely. And I also think there's something in, in retrospect which is kind of missing from this whole Dark Willow arc, which I would like to see more of, is there's not a lot of conversation about Tara. Yeah. Or not, and not even like Willow's reaction to it. It becomes more about Willow's you know, pursuit of, of, the, of the trio, but like less about why and less yeah. about how she feels about it. And I know there's an element of like, basically what we have here is that she has completely cauterized those feelings using magic and ultimately what Giles does, which I, I think is an interesting turn about is how it resolves. Is he kind of, rather than through brute, through brute force, which is, to be honest, generally how Buffy resolves everything, they find a human way through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, so like, I do like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But like, how great would it have been if, you know, they actually communicated that better, that like tar- that Willow has, because of the pain, amount of pain she felt, she has cut herself off from her own humanity and um, lost herself because of that. You know, like they never really communicate that. They just kind of say dark magic stuff. Yeah. You know, but like if they actually say, you know, she is no, she's no, she has cut herself off from her own humanity, from mm-hmm. her own ability to feel, and all she experiences is like this desire to, um, to wreak havoc. Like that is that's a great writing note. And instead, they kind of just yeah, the worst of all possible. Well, not the worst of all worlds, but like just like the mez, the most meh of lots of different options. Yeah, and see, that's the thing. It's like it's not bad, but like it's it's almost something which we find often is much more unsatisfying, which is it's kind of just middle of the road. Mm-hmm. Where it ends up being a little middle slug or a little beige about certain things, but yeah. um, not a uh, like not a, a complete um, a complete miss by any means. I, mean, I think let, let's let's talk a little bit about what the positives are for the episode and what the parts which we think did work well. So I think. Um, Absolutely, and obviously the the reintroduction of Giles. Yes, I think was, um, I imagine, and certainly when watching this initially was a surprise. Yeah, a great surprise, and I think, um, it 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 really does catalyze uh bringing a lot of these character arcs about having to mature and becoming adult and all this kind of stuff, kind of uh, paying off on those a bit. I think the obviously when he actually confronts Willow and has this power and this ability, which he really tries to characterize again isn't dominating it's not brute force it's like it's this idea of maturity around the power um it's just really thrilling and then i think they absolutely hit the nail on the head with how to play the conversation between him and buffy yeah it was excellent i think it really highlighted kind of like a lot of what has like fallen away by this point in season six like you know just it the gang feels so sparse and driven apart because like giles reintroduction it feels like oh, I remember this comfort. I've forgotten that I'd been missing it. I didn't realize I'd missed it, but like I yeah. hugely did. Like, you know, Jaws being back, it was like warm and um, comforting and kind of like very uh, emotionally present. Yeah. And like it brought like a levity. And also one of the things that Anthony Stewart Head does best is being able to go between lightness and genuine pathos, like in a really, really um, compelling way. I think that was really missing from the show. Yeah, and I think he's probably one of the best people I've ever seen on television for convincing me that he's actually laughing. Like, yeah, be- he's really good at that because he, he never he he never did play the character very like meanly strict, but it was always uh, like it, he played it in such a way that was always a delight when his like levity showed shown through. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think absolutely like with how grim dark some of this season has been and and the, and the heaviness of it, and um, Buffy like talking. Through Buffy everything. joking through like through her normal again experience was um was like compelling. Yeah, and, and, and okay, two interesting points there. One is um this really I think holds true for the relationship because um she's expecting him to be judgmental and he's never been judgmental. Yeah. Of, he's never been judgmental except for the things that really matter, but not for this kind of stuff. 
and when we have this concern that maybe the normal gang episode was a disservice to fans or even potentially introducing the idea that's actually not real like in this episode they clearly laugh it off as well like yeah. oh yeah jaw's been like yeah that we like make things a lot easier but no unfortunately this is real you know exactly all that kind of stuff i want to note one thing about his his um his fight with willow uh which i thought was absolutely compelling which is when he comes in he has this like long kind of coat on and he's walking forwards and I, w- I wish i could there's a video element of this so i could demonstrate it but like he has this like sense of like contained power you mm-hmm. know and he's holding both his hands kind of in front of him as he walks and then just flicks out one of his fingers to like um cast this and it's just it's a very classic this might not read for you necessarily but it's a very classic british magician mm. thing like actual occultist thing uh and it's just uh, and you see a little bit of it as well and um, with um uh, russell crowe's jor-el in superman uh if you remember that just i don't uh, no. yeah i thought we we talked about that before but whenever you actually have this like not showy magician but actual power from the earth wicked mm-hmm. power and kind of stuff particularly warlocks and stuff you know i yeah i just found it really like ooh, you know it's, yeah it's, it's, cool. it's cool yeah it was good uh, it was a good introduction and it was comforting um when anya says like you know i don't think he has much time left because basically willow saps jaws of all his energy and runs off with it and jaws thinks he is dying or he communicates only that mm-hmm. he is dying and Anya saying, coming, appearing to Buffy and, and Don and saying, I should go back to him. I don't think he has much time. My heart broke a little bit. Yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm fully aware that he is, continues on the show. But like, Anya feeling like Jaws is going to die and she doesn't want him to die alone. That's a very like, it's a very upsetting emotion. Can you imagine if he dies? Like what this show would be if that was very... Yeah. I, I, like in some ways, like, I kind of hate to say it, but like... It might there's some writing to it yeah, yeah i think there's something to it yeah i mean like yeah i think it would have been unnecessary at this point but also if, like, if, if he said he didn't want to be involved with the show anymore i think that would be a great age that he could yeah. back to round off handing over the adult mantle but like it would be uh, absolutely heartbreaking i totally agree but i think they couldn't have killed tara in the same season yeah i think that's fair i think then you're just like as we have seen so prolifically in the last 10 years like you just kill off people you start not investing in them yeah you know? yeah um anyway it's gonna be really interesting going forward in season seven um uh, I'm excited for it. I yeah, like. I mean, me and there's there's actually a reasonable amount of Giles content in season seven. I think most of the Giles dearth is season six, as far mm. as I can remember. But in um in season uh, Mark Fields highlights that like you know in this season and you kind of see Buffy uh kind of like she doesn't really have a thing in this episode, obviously mm. because she her thing is an emotional thing, and it's kind of all to set up what she has to offer as the hero. For her hero's journey in a um, compelli compellion, do people say that in Joseph Campbell ish, Campbell esque, Campbelliona? Oh, as in like uh, having the quality of a Joseph Campbell, uh, Campbell esque. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue. Does anyway, it? so uh, in that kind of way, her ultimate boon, as it's referred to in 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 the um, hero's journey, is the uh, being able to give. Um, is being able to distribute her power and being able to give or empower so many young women, you know? Um, and yeah, you can kind of see how this episode really does set that up, you know, in, in lots of ways where Buffy... like, So yeah, the, the Buffy stuff of this episode is actually quite good, I think. Yeah. I, I personally quite like the Buffy stuff. Um, so in this episode, you have Buffy be, play a very minor role in the in the apocalypse in a very interesting way. So she, she very much, like, oops is out of the kind of conversation when Willow sends a fireball heading towards Dawn and Xander yeah. and the two and um she she's like basically has to go run after it because like Willow's removing Buffy from the situation by threatening Dawn and Xander because she knows that Buffy can't not go to save them um which I think is just like you know it's good character writing for Buffy and then yeah obviously they fall, fall into the hole and they just have to fight and Buffy realizes that Dawn is a capable young woman and see I think she very much sees herself at 16 in Dawn mm-hmm. in this moment and what she says is she realizes that she has to, she's not trying she shouldn't try to protect Dawn from the world at this point she needs to show her the world and kind of include her and for for one I think it's like it, it's it's very much depend that depends on um Michelle uh, Trachtenberg having done a good job this season which she really has mm. um and I think the characterization of Dawn in the season was actually very good. Yeah. Um, and then, because like she's uh, like she's one of the more emotionally mature and present characters in the season, I would say. Um, and then additionally, she has to um, 
and like I think you know uh, Mark Field notes that this like very much seems like Buffy embracing her inner child you know yeah. from seasons one to five she's learning to be an adult she is now an adult and she doesn't have to repress the child in her or the experiences she's had she has to embrace those things and kind of carry them forward with her rather than trying to hide them away push them down and protect them yeah and I think that I absolutely agree and I think there's a really genuine and very well earned arc for Buffy there where you know we always have to be careful not to overlook that even within the fantasy context of what's happening here um, she is a, like a young woman and a teenager for a lot of this where she's undergoing tre- tremendous like um, a tremendously difficult situation from a 16 year old who just doesn't want to die you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. to now having responsibility for someone who is that age and and, and so much of what she does as a character and as a person being defined by loss preventing loss and grieving loss and this is yeah this is the moment i think that um she really understands that the other side of that is that if you have stuff to lose it means you've had you gained a lot in life you know you, you have the opportunity to experience mm-hmm. things and i i think that if you it's, look, a, it's kind of it's not very flashy message for yeah. your season finale but it's it's good and if you look at the show as a, as a cohesive whole, which I, 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 I really think it does work as a seven season arc in many ways. I think it works better as a five season arc, but definitely. It, it does, but these two seasons could feel completely tacked on. Yes. And they, and they, they, they don't. don't. No, they integrate very well. Yeah. But with this as a seven season arc, I think this is what gets her to the place where she could mentor other slayers next season, and eventually realizing that the the greatest thing that she can do is like a collectivist thing, a community thing. And it's yeah. like, it, it, it's not about like the and it's, again it's, 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 it, as an american show it's like really rooting this idea is like really coming to understand that the individual hero is not the point you know yeah. it, it's, it's what we can do not necessarily together but just it, you know, in parallel which i think yeah. is really, really interesting so i think the stuff in the pit um narratively for the two of them does work and i do think it's it's a it's a very buffy-esque subversion to have her just like nowhere near the action for the actual yeah because like a, a worse version of this season like an attacked on season six will have her fist fighting warring in a fucking robot or something sure, you know yeah, I mean? at yeah. the end of this like you could go that very obvious bigger but not necessarily better route yeah yeah and i think what's interesting as well about this episode is um like it, it very much concludes the buffy coming back to life stuff in a mm-hmm. very interesting way because uh in season in episode one you kind of have like of the season like literally bargaining where they are bargaining the bargaining stage of grief um mm. um and through the whole season buffy has felt like some anger and depression depression being one of the anger and depression both being stages of grief um and then and the at last this point, stage being grave <laughs> the last stage being grave the last stage being acceptance and as like you know buffy like accepts this she like comes out of the grave born anew while sarah mclaughlin is singing <laughs> yeah. uh like she what's the words she's singing um she's singing gay uh and it's in dying that we can be reborn to eternal life it was just real like okay come on like guys this is a bit heavy-handed um but like very much a, a jesus-y kind of thing where she has um you know come to accept who she is and what she's about and can progress from this point and having dealt with her internal struggles can help the people around her mm. better um, and see the people around her better anyway it was, it was it was all pretty good fun at the same time it is like a little mushy and messy um i think uh i think there's i think there's just like there's harder better writing to be done here but overall i was you know cool with the buffy stuff what did you feel, just to, I suppose, maybe bring us to a conclusion for this episode, what did you feel the actual resolution between Xander and Willow and his kind of role on the resolution? Yeah, so um, I found it very hard to swallow this time around. because, And, like, I remember when I watched this last... Uh, no, sorry, second to last... Second to last time I watched this, which was in probably 2009, 2010, maybe. Um, I found a different this, time. <laughs> yeah, and because we watched it again in 2000. 14 2013 i would mm. say um in 2010 i when i was watching it on youtube <laughs> like i watched the whole show on youtube how funny is that anyway so um i found the xander and willow stuff actually very compelling very touching and very like sad making and certainly when asa hannigan breaks down crying um and turns back into willow i found that very touching and very mm. sad and very um compelling the xander stuff is just kind of nonsense though like the the fact that he moments before 
has spoken to Don and said, um, like, uh, why would you want to find Spike? He just tried to rape your sister. And it was just like, that is some of the Yeah, he worst. says it even more sarcastically than that. I think. Yeah, it's really, and, and then he berates Don for saying, no, Spike couldn't do that. And it's like, this is some of the worst adult child interaction yeah. I've seen on a TV show. He says in- to he says to Don, who's a child, uh, like having a blind spot for Spike must be a summer's women's genetic flaw or something along yeah. those lines. Yeah, sorry, it is it is disgusting. It is genuinely it turned my stomach in the sense that like that is just so far removed from any way you should ever speak to a child. Um, but also like it's so like he there is like yeah I don't know it felt like just deeply bad writing you know yeah in, in lots of ways because I don't think they intended to make Xander this like jerk. I think they, I think there's someone in the writing room who was just like, who kind of thought these things probably. Yeah, yeah. I I think uh, there's a couple of things that have happened here with Sander. One is, I think for better or worse, as you say, the people writing his character don't realize how terribly he's coming off and how terribly it's definitely aged, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things. It's like, he's not like, the. Your, I'm sure your your sense memory of Sander is he's kind of an annoying guy, but like he's actually a terrible person in retrospect. Yeah. Um, but also what they want to happen here and what they're trying to do with Sander in this season, which maybe hasn't gotten, maybe the writing hasn't been evenly distributed, maybe he hasn't gotten the, the character attention that would make this happen. But they want him to basically get to a low point where he realizes his innate character flaws and learn from it to some degree to a mm-hmm. point where he can um like really the like the ending should be that he understands he needs to pull himself aside and do something for someone else which is what he can't do and he kind of doesn't make learn that uh, like in this arc he kind of just goes to willow yeah and it, it is kind of an example of he is surrounded by women who are better people than him and yeah. she she thinks the world of him even though maybe she shouldn't Mm-hmm. necessarily and that's why it has an effect so yeah. i understand what they're going for it's just like they they didn't actually allow his character to actually say you know what? i'm a, i'm i'm terrible and actually rather than whining about it i'm going to actually change yeah, yeah, yeah. but maybe that's a 2021 perspective to a certain degree because i think yeah. i think we our standards for people changing at that time were like okay but well, at least he turned up it's like no it's like it's not, it's not enough just to turn up yeah, yeah it, it makes it very easy to read xander's character as a as joss whedon self-insert and mm-hmm. um, because like yeah this is cunty Anyway, um, yeah, I found the the actual moment of him just repeating "I love you, I love you, I love you" like pretty trite. Yeah, I did like the bit where she um, cut his face though. Yeah, that was and good. beat the shit out. Of him. <laughs> also, I just as a last note on that, like he just steps directly into the beam of yeah. like her power, and like he could have just been incinerated. <laughs> Remember, there was like a point in season like four and five when the Xander Harris hate cast kind of took a step back. And season six has brought it all back up. I think season seven is reasonably. I don't think I can't remember him doing anything super hate hateable in season six yeah. season seven maybe when he willow and buffy kind of have that like head conversation where they exclude buffy but actually it's all intended to bring them all together again yeah yeah, yeah. it's yeah. um yeah it's funny isn't it? people remember dong as an annoying character on this show and xander just consistently is more annoying it's but, like i think it's yeah. probably a certain a certain gender element to that as well yeah probably um so yeah so it, let's uh let's get a let's 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 do a quick chat about spike as well um in this episode, in yeah, this episode, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, because like, I mean, I think this is kind of like, thankfully, it's the end of this conversation we have to have about Spike. Um, we kind of were talking about this last night, yeah. but the fact that <laughs> in Spike, our free time. <laughs> so yeah, exactly, I know. Uh, so um, first of all, the we are not alone in having experienced a lot of confusion with this episode. I certainly did when I, I, I up until probably the last couple of months, thought that Spike. Sorry, maybe like last couple of weeks. I think mm. I said this to you a couple of weeks ago. I thought that Spike was trying to fight for his chip out and end up getting given a soul. Like a bait and switch kind of Bait and of switch kind of thing where he he didn't get what he wanted. He got given what he should have, if you get me. Which in some ways would have been better writing. But um, specifically what happened was that uh, everyone thought this was the case, that, like the, the, that he was fighting for his chip out the whole time because of all of the... The acting, because James Marsh was told this that that was what he was fighting for, and all the um, he was told lines, which was what he was fighting for. The chip out, 
So he, James Maris says, "Are told he, it was the he chip. was told that the he was told that that was what we used." That makes for. a lot more sense because his lines are very like I know they're written to I suppose be interpreted, but he's like, "I'm gonna give that Slayer, I'm yeah. gonna take care of her." It's like he, no one says that and actually means I'm gonna take care of her. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So Marty Noxon has said like, "Lol, yeah, see, we did a bait and switch. Isn't that cool?" And Joss Whedon at some point during the two between the two seasons had to like at a Comic Con or something like that had to say yeah no to clarify he was he was fighting for his soul the whole time he was aware and he was fighting for his soul so like the fact that you have to clarify that like in commentary in some situation is it's not good it's not a great sign yeah um but um and it, it, so that's all whatever and then addition additionally the season sorry the what we're saying was that the the fact that he actually like has the sense to fight to try to regain his soul like surely there's something wrong to be done there where like you know if he's doing that he doesn't need a soul like i mean to to want a soul surely you have to have one to some degree like the messiness around spike who has been transformed by his love for buffy um it's like well if he can be transformed by his love for buffy into wanting good what you like does the soul make any significant huge difference in that yeah. point and like you know maybe the better writing thing to do there is to say when you get there is say you already have it like you like you don't need one you already have as in like this this metaphysical thing it doesn't have more property than the what you've been trying to do so it kind of goes for this like soul as like consumable item that yeah. exists in the world a and battery it, that powers your moral center yeah exactly and thankfully though this um is the conclusion of the messy spike nonsense yeah and I think something we said early on in the show is that there is an universe explanation that people have that the, the characters, the White Hawks, have a very black and white understanding of what a vampire is. Yeah. And that that is not necessarily true. It's just how they characterize it. But the show, they have a fairly clear distinction that when, you, when you're not in souls, even if we're not necessarily saying it's a completely different demon necessarily inside mm-hmm. of you, there was always this thing of that while you might have some uh, personality draw towards love or any of this kind of stuff you can never quite get it right because you're just you don't have the humanity for it and i think in wanting to like inherently in wanting to defang and humanize spike as a character before he had a soul they inherently blurred that where it's like as you say you know because he kind of what the soul gives him is a big of a, a hall pass through all the horrible things he's done because you he's can now all, a different character. He's a different person, yeah. yeah, essentially. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's it's a, it's a funny one because like the show, um, especially, especially Joss Whedon, talks a lot around it saying, oh, the intricacies of the plot and the magic and the, log- the magic logic there, it's not important. It's all to mm-hmm. get to a character point. Um, and I think they have made that mistake themselves here where they have invested um in a character and gone for like a two-pronged approach to um reforming him where it's both magical and non-magical so both like you know trying to follow a magic logical magically logic messy thing and then also trying to say oh but also he was kind of good beforehand kind of yeah so um it was it was a mess but thankfully we don't have to worry about it going into the future the last thing i'll say is that the the season finale um the concluding image of this episode really strong the spike getting in sold and his eyes going all like like white and lighty and stuff yeah it's also the first season that doesn't end with a image of the scoobies yeah. um like kind of like walking away together essentially to some degree or group shot um, and instead focuses on spike at this moment it's a great season finale it's a great cliffhanger it's great like ooh, yeah um it's a it's a hook to go into the next season i do i do think it's interesting to see season six and seven with more of a two-part story necessarily yeah mm-hmm so for this episode let's do the dusting yeah okay so um can i give you some buffy bits joel <laughs> so uh kingsman bluff uh, kingsman's bluff is where Bu- willow goes um to raise the satanic temple um and she uses some nice ropes to do so uh it is the same place where angel intends to commit suicide in amends which is kind of interesting and also pretty appropriate there's lots of um kind of there's lots of uh similarities between these storylines and a link with the first as well and a link with the first absolutely um you mean in the sense that willow's magic to bring buffy um alive is what brings the first into the world in season seven 
so if I remember, if I remember correctly, he he goes to Kingsman Bluff to because, kill no, yeah, because of the first, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. So and yes, and because of her magic, yeah. um, yes, yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. It kind of ties together with the the motive for season seven. Get you. So um, Alison Hannigan apparently got dust in her eyes in the hill, so that's why there are some shots where she had, doesn't have black eyes before she de oh, de dark willows. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she couldn't wear the contacts anymore, so they were going to do it in post. But there are a couple of shots where they just don't do it for whatever reason. Um, apparently, one of the original plans for this episode was for Buffy to fight the dragon that comes out of the portal in the end of the gift. Oh, right. um, and the instead, the, the 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 budget all went to once more feeling. But that dragon apparently does appear in uh, in not fade away. Oh, it's the, it's the same dragon, is it? Yeah. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah, so that's the, that's that dragon, apparently. Yeah, the, yeah, so not fake way being the finale of Angel, so like the 100% is the dragon there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, uh, one thing I meant to mention in terms of the, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the kind of the Jesus-y kind of stuff there was um, very much ties into what Tara had said previously in the season about, uh, like the second coming and stuff like that. Um, what, I can't remember what line she used from it, but um, anyway. What Earth Beast, etc., etc., etc. Um, that kind of ties in. And apparently, Joss Whedon wrote the yellow crayon dialogue. Um, and he also said that the season seven's theme would be back to the beginning, which I think is pretty accurate. Yeah, and interesting. Yeah. Okay, do you have any any buffy bits for me there, Joel? Yeah, I just know that the um, the Earth monsters that they that, um, Dong and Buffy fight are essentially Power Rangers. Uh, monsters kind yeah. of like uh parents Putty. putties yeah. yeah um which is like an, an, an og vibe and yeah we also know as well that the temple that's raised and um, they know it was buried in the earthquake of 1932 32? yeah which um i don't know if it's necessarily the exact same earthquake as the one from the master but i think yeah i think there's like a, it's a reasonable understanding yeah that. so yeah or, or, or at the very least that like a similar force is kind of buried yeah, yeah, yeah. underneath the town etc and also, uh, bizarrely, I think you said you read this somewhere, but when the magic sh shop is being destroyed, also RIP, the magic shop, um, one of the books that is very prominently displayed is uh, William Shatner's troubled uh, self-penned novel series, Tech Wars. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I suppose just one of my last questions was, like, for all these trials that Spike went through, were all of them just physical? Just thought it was coming kind of odd note and rest of yeah, like, the, the, the there was Beatles, no... the Beatles was a weird one as well. It was like, what was the point of that part? Was it just to torture him a little bit? But or... yeah, but it's just like, is it just, you just have to be and survive stuff? Is there no, if you're trying to get a soul back to be in beauty humanity, is there no psychological elements, no moral test, like nothing other than just like big up this flame boy? Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, like I think this, that whole sequence would have been handled much better in Angel. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They have more of a more of a basis for that kind of thing. Yeah, I think they're just better at like you know, like bringing characters to a new place and doing stuff with them that is convincing. Um, versus mm -hmm. this show. Okay. Um, and do you have any fashion notes there, Joel? Yeah, I don't think there's any distinct fashion in this episode. Though, Not really. Because no. we're again we're, ca we're carrying on from the previous couple. What I will say is that um, I actually like Giles's look. I was making out to know it's like that's a nice look. I might keep an eye out for something like that when winter comes around again. Yeah, yeah. I liked how his coat had his uh, had the um, collar upturned uh, yeah. at the back. I was like lovely. Um, he looked very young, very very attractive. He did, yeah. I mean, I didn't say that anyway. So um, death count. Do you have one first? Yeah. So multiple horn demons uh, killed by Spike. Three earth go golems destroyed by a sword uh, with uh, by Buffy. One decapitated by Dong. Go Dong. Uh, and two, two earth golems which were automatically destroyed when Dark Willow became again normal <laughs> as it, per the wiki is it maybe the least deaths in any um, season finale actually no Restless probably yeah I was, was yeah it's, it's kind of it's definitely one of the smaller scale act from an actual uh, the whole episode was quite small scale in terms of the actual fighting that they do and stuff yeah agreed okay and do you have a rating for me Joel yeah, I would say I want to give this maybe an eight point for um demonic girl boss temples, okay, great. um because and I actually I don't know how that compares with the other season finales, but I imagine most of the season finales uh, I've been higher on. Yeah, um, I think it's a perfectly good season finale, but I it's think not. Most we've given ten to more often than not. Yeah, I would expect that because usually they they, they do just pay off a, a little oh, more. Yeah. Um, I think it does bring together the themes of this season very well and i think it has some very interesting imagery in it mm -hmm. it's just uh, in bringing together those themes it can only work with what's there and some of the themes have been a little muggy i yeah. think um so 
I think an interesting idea. I just don't think the execution was entirely there, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm going to say 8.1 Great Balls of Fire out of 10. Um, I thought it was... Uh, I thought it was... Yeah, I think there are lots of interesting things there. Um, I think ultimately... If you look at what actually happens in the episode, there's not a huge amount to it. You know, a lot of the emotions I feel about the episode are kind of like in the kind of the like the collective conclusion to a story more so than like things that happen there. I think there are great moments. Um, I think Emma Caulfield is great in it. I think uh, I think Alison Hannigan is genuinely very good. I think she has some like awkward moments in some mm-hmm. of these things um, where she gets a bit too like um, just the tone doesn't quite hit. I think I thought uh, Anthony Stewart Head was great. I thought um, I, I thought Sarah Michelle Gellar was great. I thought Michelle uh, Trachtenberg was great. Uh, Finn, Finn, go fuck yourself, uh, Xander Harris. <laughs> That's not fair. I thought like you know as as per usual, um, Nicholas uh, Brendan. <laughs> Nicholas Brendan does an absolutely grand job. There's no, there's nothing like I I never have an issue with Nicholas, Nicholas's Brendan acting. Act, his acting I often find them actually very funny and very compelling. It's just the writing that yeah, I've made yeah, issue with. Yeah. We're not a, we're not a Nicholas Brennan hate cast. Yeah, anyway, it's important. Though. It is an important distinction to make. The, the, yeah. the character as on the page is what he's working with. Yeah, yeah. though, like, like, I, I, like, I mean, he 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 seems to have a bit, like a pretty spotty history. Like we all know lots about Nicholas Brennan's history. But, like I have no interest in like like besmirching some, piling on that. Yeah, yeah some guy anyway, in the sense that like yeah, Joss Whedon is a completely different kind of kettle of fish. Anyway, um, okay, cool. Should we go into the Season six breakdown. Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. So uh, we have our traditional categories for the season six yep. um, breakdown. I'll be the. Uh, shall I be the questioner? Yeah, which I'm sure in the past we probably had some kind of a, uh, a, yeah. a witty name for a season season summary. Summer. Yeah, no, like the Buffy Ann summary that yeah. we already do. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So Joel, what is your season rating out of ten? Um, so I it gave should be ten some. It should be something. Yeah, don't, no, don't worry. I did the I did the assignment this time. Um, I I've given this season eight point two bloody fingernail marks on the inside of your coffin. Okay, great. Um, so I kind of looked at the season. Um, you know, I look at the episodes together. I kind of get a sense. I think there's some really distinctly strong episodes and enjoyable episodes in this season. Um, I think that the. I'm much warmer on the themes now than I ever have been before. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's because I'm a little bit older now watching it. It's like this idea of um, how the, it's just a little nebulous in terms of what the actual problem is, but they're all dealing with this personal stuff. Uh, I think comes off mostly well, and I think they land most of it. Um, I think that um, Buffy and Willow's arc specifically, um, except for a couple of bum notes there, um, there are really, really good arcs of television. Uh, and I found more that I liked than I didn't more than I liked than I didn't like on this watch and um, but this season has a, a lot of individual episodes which while not bag episodes in the way that Go Fish was a bag episode um, don't go anywhere don't go anywhere aren't super memorable um, and at times are a little boring which I think is like a real wobbly point for the season so it's weirdly I think it works well as a season mm-hmm. but not as a collection of episodes yeah I think that's one of the things that you need to bear in mind with Buffy is that when you get to the end of a season like look at season four season four probably has weaker episodes overall like the weaker episodes of season four are weaker than the weakest episodes of season six um that being said I think the strongest episodes of season four are also stronger than the strongest episodes of season yeah. six um but also the setting of season four is great you know there's endless enjoyment in the college stuff and the, in the military stuff I, I have no personal real like love for but like Buffy kind of like uh, her burgeoning romance and her like you know being in college and like all like the, the X-Files kind of inspires kind of science meets the mystic like there's, yeah. there's stuff there there was still inter- there's, interesting there's just, stuff there there's just tons to really enjoy so like you know you get to the end of the season you're like I spent a year in college with Buffy and that's like yeah, exactly, an emotional yeah. space that like you know is very enjoyable to exist in um, so for my writing for season six I want to reflect that because um, season six I think is a slog in some ways mm. just like you know while there's like enjoyment of you know being in, in the magic play the magic box um, you kind of you spend a lot of time in the season with characters in different places depressed sad and you don't get the sense like you know oh season six is the season where Buffy blood except for was depressed yeah and was unemployed for a bit yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know Willow's an addict so and there's no child for the most part so all those kind of things um, kind of leave me to so I'm, I rated it a seven yellow crayons out of ten. Mm. 
Um, I had given season four 7.5, so I thought that was about right. Yeah. Um, in the sense that there's greatness to be had in season six. There's very interesting, like uh, there's there's like it's fascinating. I hugely enjoy watching it, but also yeah, it doesn't it doesn't always do what I need to, it yeah. to do as a season. Absolutely, I can definitely say that. And for me, I'm kind of I'm definitely happy with my higher rating because. I probably had quite a, a low opinion this season yeah. previously because I, I was kind of like I kind of didn't even bother to remember a lot yeah, of it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, and and also to be fair, something which I, I didn't mention is that the the built-in trope of the trio's misogyny and how that interacts really with well the themes, I think it works well. Yeah. Um, so. And I think one of the things that I found, like, I mean, uh, yeah, one of the, so okay, let's talk about the next part, which is favorite episode. So Joel, um, let me talk here for a second. So while i was doing up this list i was like there's a significant amount of episodes that i could have as my favorite episode um there's one very obvious answer but like it's a it's a strong season for good standout weird episodes that are kind of surprising so um for me like you know with the things that kind of could have been potentials were dead things which was like genuinely disturbing dark um to build a rasa genuinely funny and dramatic obviously uh there was normal again loved it thought it was absolutely great um, and I think it's like a, I think it's a great treatise on what this show is. And seeing red, I like you know came to really mm-hmm. not respect, but fast it became I found it very compelling and fascinating yeah. as an episode. And like internally quite well handled within that one episode, if you get me. Um, but the episode I chose, shocking no one, is once more feeling. Yeah, because it brings together everything you love about Buffy. It's a very clear 10 out of 10 episode for any context. It is fun. The music is great. The portrayals of the characters are great. There is, it has darkness and levity and um, weirdness and intrigue. And like, you know, it's just like, it's a, it's, it's a stunning episode. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think there's a lot of when you go through the season better more memorable episodes uh which i think probably deserve a little bit of maybe re-examination by the, the fandom such as the guys i think me. so too yeah um so the honorable mentions for, I, I agree with a lot of the episodes you mentioned there. the honorable mentions for me that i picked out were tabula rasa because i think classics um scenario yeah classic opportunity for people to learn more by playing other people in some yeah, ways and yeah, yeah. um, perhaps controversially but favor for me uh, i put in double meat palace i um, was think, i was considering storing it in there as well because it's funny sarah michelle geller is funny when you let her be it is kind of trashy but like it's just it's, it was it was fucking funny to watch it enjoyed itself it enjoyed itself uh and yeah and that this i i i maybe we, we can be the spearhead of the like bring to build a rasa and beer bad and use <laughs> yeah. the dumps of buffy because when buffy, buffy is at its worst when it doesn't know what it's doing and it knew what it was doing in those episodes it was having a bit of fun yeah. and being stupid yeah and i think like like a lot of people who are very protective of their show like want to sometimes pretend like it's all bangers all the time and always on point but like we love these shows because they make we do weird things and yeah and because like you like with a 22 episode season you have to have a comfortable place to come back to with see with your characters to see your characters this week if it, you had the body or once more feeling every week it, it's not a good show anymore yeah you need highs and lows uh, and for highs i also pick once more feeling um I that, as, your, as my top my number yeah. one uh, I didn't want to do that just by oh everyone says it by Roche but like a lot of the great episodes of Buffy we've never revisited um, it just is good it's, it's, it's you gen- know it's genuinely great it, it, I think it brought a lot of people it's, it's a very fun memory for people I think the experience of it um, brought a lot of people to the show in some ways mm-hmm. um, like the music still stands up and fundamentally importantly crucially it really works as an episode of the show. It progresses the themes. It works with the characters. Um, as we said, when we did the episode, once more feeling there's been loads of musical episodes and other shows, but they're like novelties. This actually gets them somewhere, which I yep. think is really gold standard. It's 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 gold standard for, for musical episodes of anything. And it's a gold standard for a Buffy episode as well. Okay. Um, do you think we'll rate all the episodes at some point? Rank them all, I mean? Oh, that's an interesting idea. That could be something we do when we're doing... So we've been kind of banding about how to handle Angel Season 5. Mm. I think maybe a good fun thing to do would be to like have... Because I think... Uh, I would have to imagine that people, if they're listening... like You'd have to imagine that there'd be a little drop-off in listenership after Buffy ends. you know, Because this is a Buffy podcast, you might not be interested in Angel. So I was thinking about maybe doing something like two episodes of Angel per week. We'd talk about them not too in-depth. And also talk about what we've been watching. But maybe, yeah, one of those we could do... Um, like rank every Buffy episode. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think some. Um, or, you know, we'd probably want to if we're doing. We could do ranking every Buffy episode over a season of, of Angel or some of that actually. 
because like there's 144 episodes of Buffy, mm. so you could talk about seven episodes of Buffy ranking them and do then your your Cordelia chase afterwards. That could be a fun. Thing to yeah, do. I think so. So I think yeah, there's definitely some meat there which we would enjoy doing around um buffy adjacent stuff and pop culture adjacent stuff that's kind of falling on from these kind of like yeah. buffy themes uh but something like i think we'll we'll, we'll maybe get a bit of a yeah. bit, of, bit of a sense from people like what might be what might be fun to listen to i was also thinking maybe we could do an episode just before we wrap up the whole buffy thing in season seven um maybe we could get like listeners to like send in a couple of questions or comments or like i don't know experiences with the podcast we got this incredible email a couple of maybe a year ago now a couple of months ago from a listener who had like listened to buffy while during an operation and it's like the only thing i think about like every week and when we're recording and i'm like that's so fucking nice yeah anyway so i'd love experience like that well we'll talk about it later on but we'll we'll kind of figure that out yeah it's such a lovely like the reality of it is there's still people connecting across like incredible distances and stuff which i i still think is pretty cool Agreed. um so to turn to like a less uh a sorry less, yeah. Go on. Sa- a less saccharine note um we are now going to talk about the worst episodes of the season 100 percent. so joe what was your worst episode of the season yeah so i i, I picked one honor- honorable mention or dishonorable mention for this which was gone Mm-hmm. Um, where Buffy is invisible, yeah. Um, and just I, I just really didn't feel I, I, I really didn't felt comfortable with how it portrayed her and kind of the tone of it and some of the stuff around the sex scene with Spike and all that. The and sex scene with Spike was a real. Di- I mean, it, it, it was part, again, it was just tea for teens, and it was like very special episode, but also like girl goes off the rails, and there was just an element. Of, I, I don't know if disrespect of what I mean, but like I don't, like, I don't think it, it was. It, it, didn't work it wasn't fun to watch. Yeah. Um. Then my worst episode was Hell's Bells wow okay yeah. that's um, that, i'm very surprised back Could like tell me more. there's episodes in this season which are bad and difficult and like weird in different ways but just like because it's so focused on the xander and Anya thing inherently which i feel like was talked about and yet not shown a lot of mm-hmm. the time i think suddenly suddenly it ramps up yeah uh, and there's like a wedding here uh, and again it's a setting where having the human family, the demon family, all these extras, they don't really know what to do with it. I think that the um the the Scoobies have almost nothing to do in the episode. I think the actual plot device is contrived. The flash flash forward scenes where it's like, oh look at this really yeah. comic uh, half demon child and also he kills on you with a frying pan, lol. Yeah. Um I'm not sure about kills, but yeah. But like you know, attacks her with or mm-hmm. whatever. But that is the fear that he has is that he's gonna hurt her. Um and then we're kind of meant to sympathize equally with Xander and Anya to some degree, yeah. but like he just is like unsympathetic, and it's it's just it's just a weird, not good episode. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my um, honorable dishonorable mention for this one was wrecked because um, yeah, this is one where where Willow uh, goes off the deep end with the magic. She's hanging out with Amy, and they do weird shit at the at the bronze. And it ends up with Willow going around with to, to Rack's place and putting Dawn in danger. And it was just totally a mess and crap. I didn't like it. And then the um, the one I actually chose in the end was As You Were, which is the Riley coming back episode. Oh, yeah. I fucking hated it. And the fact that he just like zooped off into the into the air at the end, yeah. like it just felt like, yeah, okay, see it, Riley. We, I think it might be the most disengaged I've seen you watch an episode of Buffy. <laughs> I, I would totally agree. It's the episode, It's maybe the episode of Buffy I would at least want to watch it again. Okay. Who's your favorite character, Joe? Yeah, so my, my honorable mention for this I gave to Anya because um, mm-hmm. I think I, I also think I didn't really appreciate Anya so much in my first watch through. Sure. I, I think her storyline always happens in the background to a large degree, um, but I think it has some really interesting stuff, and I think that she is Emma Caulfield does just a consistently great job. And um, my favorite season character for the season I've decided to give to Willow, okay, um, because I actually think on this rewatch and this really culminates Willow's story to a large degree. She has story in the next season, but this is her her thing, um. She is the most developed storyline across Buffy other than Buffy. Yeah, you know? agreed. Um, and I think she actually, we, we noted from her earliest episodes, here is seeds of the kind of, at times, impatient character that she has yeah. uh, that will stretch all the way through to Dark Willow. Um, and I think that um, the various turns it takes is fantastic and fascinating. Uh, I think she is ultimately like a very meaningful queer representation. So I want to give it to Willow for this season. Sure. So my real answer is Buffy. In the sense that, like, of course, my favorite character in the season <laughs> yeah. is Buffy. Um, I, and specifically in the season, I love what Buffy goes through. I, as in, I think it's a fascinating journey. And I think it's an important part of who she is going forward. And up to this point is going through this 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 period. Um, but what I, who I'm actually going to give it to is Tara um, oh, for the season. Um, 
really, really enjoyed her representation of the season. She was much more sure-footed and strong and uh, self-determined in the season than I ever really expected. And yeah, I'm just I, I felt really felt a pang in the season of like see Tara. I'm really, yeah. I'm really sad about that. I definitely appreciate that. Okay, um, who was your least favorite character, Joel? Uh, yeah, so um, again, this honorable mention, uh, briefly, I gave to Spike. Um, and it's not because I don't like Spike as a character. I actually quite like him and enjoyed James Myers' and all that. But just because, like, you can't talk about or enjoy or watch season six without everyone having to talk about the weird stuff with Spike and the weird yeah. characterization and the stuff with Buffy. And it just leaves a bad taste in the mouth. Of course. Um, and I think that the fact that he is kind of has to be kind of the breakout character and kind of disrupts the Scoobies, I don't like that. Although I do like Spike as a character. Um, and then number one, Xander. Uh, yeah. I, I may have given that before, but I think um, some of the stuff with Xander in previous seasons has been like incidental teenage stuff. Yeah. This whole season, is his arc is just that he is terrible to the women around him. He's terrible to Anya. He is unhelpful to Dong and Buffy. He is always making either about him or feeling sorry for himself. Yeah. Um, and you know what? The other characters also feel sorry for themselves, and they also t- t- turn up and do stuff and yeah. help. You know? so, uh, and yet, like, if I wasn't feeling that going into this episode, uh, the way he spoke to uh, both Dong and Buffy around the Spike stuff is like absolutely like reprehensible, I think. Yeah, I have to agree. Uh, Xander is my least favorite of the season. Uh, Warren, strong honor- honorable mention. Fair. Is honorable <laughs> mention. But at the same time, he's written to be disliked. And they do such a great job with that in the sense that like he's not my least favorite character because like he was great to watch. He was great yeah. to hate. Xander, unintentionally, the least like likable character yeah. by far. Okay, who is your favorite bit character, Joel? My... Um favorite bit character i gave to uh mr kaltenbach from all the way oh yeah which was don's uh where she has saying it was like stake her vampire boyfriend or whatever mm-hmm. that thing was it um and he was like the, the presented kind of the creepy old man who lured the boys into his house and oh, used, to be, yeah, used to be a toy knife, maker the knife guy the knife guy and then like they ended up eating him that was the turn yeah, about yeah, yeah. uh and i just thought it was kind of classic like season one to three character and it was such like a a simple setup like this creepy old toy maker who's learned yeah, these boys yeah. into the house and it turns out he's the victim and i just I, as a bit character i was like that's funny that's good yeah so i picked clem which i think very yeah really, clem's a great choice yeah. yeah i love clem i just think he's a sweetheart and i just like the, the when he when he's around it's more like the derby kittens which i appreciate yeah. Who was your least favorite bit character, Joel? Um, I went Rack. Same. Yeah, because yeah. I uh, so I'll, I'll, does nothing I, for me. Does nothing. It's really tying into the parts of the season we didn't like around the addict stuff, where it is a little kind of like, oh, you taste like strawberries, and now I'm juiced up. What a rush. Yeah. Uh, he like the kind of the, the concept of the floating demon place, etc. I think is kind of cool, but like he, uh, yeah, he's just not a, a nice character to. In, no. his, his, none of the scenes he's in are good. Yeah. You know? Agreed. Um, what was your favorite outfit? And my favorite outfit, I went for the Double Me Palace uniform. Um, <laughs> with the, the cow chicken combo? Like, iconic to start off with, but the fact that I realized this time around that the front half of, the, of it is a, I think the front half is the chicken, the back half is a cow. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. And, you know, Sarah Michelle Gerard looks great in it. She can look great in a burlap sack, as you said. Tr- yeah. She truly would. Uh, I chose Anya's wedding outfit, um, specifically mm. where she's wearing the eye mask. I fucking love that shit. Um, I just think she, I, I just think she looks absolutely stunning. And actually, my worst, the worst outfit for me, my least favorite, was uh, Willow and Tara at Willow's we- at Anya's wedding. That dress is the ugliest fucking dress I've ever seen in my yeah. life. <laughs> what was your least favorite, Joel? My least favorite was the outfit the Warren wears when he goes, he gets the orbs of whatever and goes to pick up women. Oh yeah, because um, he looks like someone who needs to get queer eyes. Do you he know what truly, I mean? truly does. Uh, uh, he had like a green, neon green, massive shirt with like long wing tips and like mm-hmm. a suit that's three sizes too big. Yeah, uh, I'm just glad we didn't live through that particular era of men's fashion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the best monster for you? The best monster and um, my honorable mention i gave to the child of words from afterlife which okay. is the which is the monster kind of the thamaturgy monster that comes mm, through that is cool and um, because it's kind of a, it's a cool spooky poltergeist thing anyway so it's not not, not technically poltergeist like a specter but uh, it was that remember like did all like um made anya possessed yeah, and like did cool. the skull faces yeah, on yeah. The, i just thought all oh, that was cool and uh, actually like a little spooky when i watched mm-hmm. it um 
And being me, I did give my favorite monster to be the penis monster from Double Me Pass. It's a Double Me heavy list for me, I think. Yeah. But like, what the fuck was that? I like, we we talk so high and mighty on this podcast about critical theory, all that kind of stuff. But like, the part I don't get to bring into this is the fact that I love gooey, stupid horror stuff. You yeah, know? And it, is, it is very much that. Yeah. So my favorite um, monster I gave to Sweet. I thought it was a very, like, clear one. Great portrayal, loads of fun, like, bizarre, great design. He takes his mouth off. It's it's all, like, it's all there for me. Love it. Yeah. And he survives. He beats yeah. us. And funnily enough, I gave my worst monster to the penis monster. <laughs> fair, fair. It, 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 it's designed to evoke a reaction. I it think really we, is. we both got different ways. <laughs> what was your least favorite uh, monster? Uh, I gave it to Stuart Burns and Hell's Bells. And yeah. um, the future is under slash yeah, actually should. someone because like not only it was it like a contrived device which I used to think was cooler than it is. Mm-hmm. Um, in watching the episode, I think my feeling was I really don't know who he is, what he's trying to achieve. It's one of those, it's one of those classic Buffy slash Angel things where it's like you've conveyed the sense of what's happened, mm-hmm. but if you actually break it down, I don't think everyone in the writers room agreed on what he, what he was <laughs> doing. Uh, and so it's just stupid. It was just stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and um, we definitely didn't just take a two-hour break from recording. So, um, Joel, should we do the um, Cordelia Chase for the week? Yes, Lex, Lex B. I've been percolating on this. Um, so, we have the end of um, Season 3 of mm-hmm. Angel, uh, episode tomorrow. Yeah. And it has a couple of... Um, significant <clears throat> things that happen. There's a couple of significant things that happen and kind of very key, I suppose, to the mythology of the show. So, just to focus on them, um, we have Angel and Connor kind of coming seemingly close together developing this father son demon hunter vibe etc he says don't call me steven anymore call me conger etc um and the real motivation for this through kind of washy um wishy-washy plot reasons is for conger to get him in a position of vulnerability where he can punish him for Mm -hmm. the alleged death of holtz um so it's a weird one because the dynamic between them when they're doing that actually works pretty okay. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's an enjoyable idea that you could have properly kind of, you know, Angel and Conger vampire hunters kind of thing. Um, and again, it seems like the Conger is actually getting something from it, but it's, it's all a setup for this betrayal, essentially. This episode is probably goes hand in hand with parts of season six of Buffy where uh, people are really getting split to their the nth uh, degree so there's a focus on that there is uh, something which I actually forgot about the show which is that Lauren leaves town uh, so mm-hmm. in in this episode uh, partly because Connor has been mean to him yeah partly because Connor is being xenophobic um, and otherwise you have Wesley's kind of descent into darkness and he ends up sleeping with Lila and being seduced a bit by Wolfman Hart and I think uh, Alexis Downsoff does a great job at this role and has really like had such a great progression I think from mm-hmm. uh, Buffy to this um, but it does leave him you know ne- without any real kind of um, like he's never really happy again and this is a real uh, star of that kind of um, you know track for him um, and then, perhaps most, uh, you know, kind of controversially or, or kind of challengingly, the season ends with um, a, a very rushed kind of, um, you know, Gru leaves Cordelia and makes her realize that she's loved Angel all this time. Um, Lauren tells Angel that Cordelia loves him, etc. They both, they both kind of sex, sex likes on each other to meet somewhere arbitrary. Uh, out by the sea, I think. Rather than just you know at the hotel which they own. Yeah, and such a good, it's a point that I saw about this as well. Is that um, if I remember the flow of events correctly, Angel goes to the sea to meet Cordelia because that's where Cordelia asked him to meet. Mm-hmm. But the plan Connor has to like screw him over is based around him being at the sea. Yeah, yeah. It's very so good it couldn't possibly have come together that way. Yeah. Um, and so essentially, you have Cordelia. Cordelia and so essentially you have Cordelia on the way there to realize her love for Angel um, and she gets confronted by uh, Skip who is the demon from the episode Billy who also gave her her semi-demon powers and says time to go uh, you've been recognized as a warrior of light and you're going to ascend now to be one of the powers that be and fight the same battle on a greater plane and Angel's left waiting for her uh, gets betrayed by Connor who um, welds him into a um, a 
metal coffin mm-hmm. and sends him to the death of the ocean because as a vampire he doesn't want to kill him he wants to torture him uh, for an extended period of time so you have this image of Cordelia going up <laughs> and Angel going down yep. uh, and that's what we pass as for symbolism these days um, it's, it's bittersweet there's elements of it that I like mm-hmm. uh, and like a lot of the show by this point you can take out individual interactions and all that and they work fairly well but part of the problem with this is I think Cordelia has a great arc um, from the start of Buffy to here and I definitely love the idea of her eventually developing into that she is independently like a proto slayer in many ways like has all the qualities that a slayer would need to have and that they're like her rather than Angel you're going to be a power of the bee mm-hmm. um, and it, it, I, I definitely remember watching this and feeling it was bittersweet when they were separated but the fact that uh, this is the last we ever see of the real Cordelia until that one episode in season 5 mm-hmm. um, and the fact that the it's all supposedly orchestrated by Jasmine for her to come into being. It just makes it nonsensey. It kind of, if we're to take that at face value, it invalidates Cordelia's whole arc because when Skip is like, you know, you've, you've, you've earned this, life, you've done yeah. it. Yeah, that's all essentially a lie. So I yeah. don't like writing that does that. No, me neither. Um, I think it was gas to watch. Like, it just like... Or turn- like turning into a ball of light and zooming off. Yeah, and then like angel being like stuck in a coffin it's kind of it's like it, it becomes more schlocky tv than poignant tv yeah um but that being said i think it was straightforward i think it was good interactions there's some good fight scenes again i'm kind of feeling maybe a seven fail feminist gestures yeah i'm gonna give it a generous seven as well i found that the while there were elements that like you know like i mean the the, the cordelia thing and the angel connor thing when taken straight pretty fascinating or not fascinating pretty entertaining and enjoyable watching and like you know twisty and turny and it's a good like place to leave your for this for your characters for the season conclusion um and the wesley stuff all pretty good um yeah but at the same time like you know the episode itself not really much happened yeah you know there's no threat there was no significant thing it kind of feels like for the last couple episodes they've kind of just been hanging out and when i was doing some research about this season not research when i was reading back over the season um of angel i really enjoyed it the the episode where wesley kills or sorry wesley tries to hand off connor was episode 16 like it feels like it was only like two or three episodes ago but yeah. like this whole thing like has felt like it's all been one kind of thing and it's darla was at the start of the season yeah like i mean the, the back end of the season has felt very cl- like um very heavy in terms of what happened but at the yeah. same time in individual episodes not a huge amount happens sometimes anyway um it was a great season of angel at the same time yeah and um, so i think we kind of come to a close on that there and i also think a, a damning note for angel going forward in some ways is the wikipedia notes that in this episode angel says to cordelia cordelia i need you around because who's going to help connor understand the facts of life and the wikipedia says cordelia explains this to him and more in graphic detail in the next season uh so awful um over, overall rating for the season i think probably a i'm good for an eight eight i think is fair good season of television overall totally agree Season four, I'm not looking forward to a huge amount, but season five should be great fun. Season four is going to be a fun watch, not necessarily very good. And season five is like a victory lap, and I enjoy yeah. it. And Spike is there. I look forward yeah. to that. Um, so I think that brings us to an end for a season finale of Buffy Boys. It doesn't. So we have to do a quick wrap on our best of season for the season of Angel, a very quick one. Um, so Joel, what was your... What was the best Angel season episode of the season for you? Okay, you can get you can edit all that in post, I presume, and make it oh, seem I like I was, really, I, I was really organized. Um, my best for angel for this Mm -hmm. season is waiting in the wings yeah me too um just straightforward is the episode with summer glow where they're in the um the ballet um and just a high for the show overall i think um every it's a a buffy worthy episode do you know i mean yeah i would agree with that yeah every everyone in the gang is working together because the clear monster this and poignant there's kind of imagery some, there's poignance but also funniness like there, all the horniness is quite funny yeah exactly and uh, it progresses the characters you know so i like that yeah me too um my other options were potentially going to be sleep tight which is the one where where um wesley uh g- gives away connor which i just sound very thrilling mm. or uh, billy very clear one yeah very good a lot of me and billy yeah um, and then Joel, what was your worst episode for the season? So I went for a double or nothing. Same. Yeah, which wasn't that long ago. I, I'm, I'm amazed you even remember anything to dislike about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it combines a couple of uh, the worst traits of Angel um, as a show. Focusing on gun <laughs> and doing such a bad job. Yeah, the real... specifically the, the, the it, it really 
pulls out into this daylight this when they focus on Gong and they can't write him and they just do kind of a whole gangster and scare quotes kind of thing mm-hmm. um, it really does that quite bad for him in this episode the actual plot is really thin um, it was a conclusion that once again I was like you've told me the episode is over but I don't know what happened in it mm-hmm. uh, and, or why it existed or why exactly and so just like not a, not a shiny, shiny moment uh, I think yeah there was other episodes that really weren't as entertaining but that was one that was just like it just wasn't a good episode yeah unfortunately Okay, um, so I think, like, you know, wrapping on season six of Buffy and season three of Angel, I think we can note that, like, for both of them, unfortunately, Joss Whedon's, like, um, missingness is felt. I think, you know, scum of the, scum human though he is, Mm -hmm. um, like, I think the seasons were lesser because of his lack of involvement. Uh, He was off doing Firefly at this time. He kind of lost interest in Angel and Buffy to some degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I think think that comes back for season seven of Buffy a little bit and for season five of of Angel for sure. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to season, the final season of Buffy, which is fucking wild. And I think, yeah, coming to a close on season six of Buffy, uh, a lot has happened in this season in the show. A lot has happened uh, both Buffy-wise and non-Buffy-wise in the world over the course of our season of Buffy Boys. Quite a... You know, you can't you can't go home again. I think yeah, after yeah. this season of the podcast, yeah. Um. So, are we happy? And um, are you just doing foley work over there? No, 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 fuck off. Come on, are we happy? Are you happy to draw this season to a conclusion? We are. Okay. Do your thing. Will do. Um. So, Brian. Yes. Thank you so much for doing this season, Thanks, Buffy Joel. Boys, with me. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, everyone, for your engagement uh, and for taking this journey with us and just being... Tweet us and tell us your favorite episode of, of yeah. either Angel or Buffy this season. I'd love that. Or of Buffy Boys. That might be cute as well. Oh, yeah. Tell us your favorite episode of Buffy Boys. Yeah. Um, and we, we appreciate you. We hope we'll see you uh, next season for season seven. Um, and if you are have some very chaotic friends who want to start listening to a podcast about Buffy at season seven, absolutely tell them to jump on board. Um, but otherwise... Um, we will see you like literally next week um, for Buffy Boys if you enjoyed this episode let us know tell your friends tell the lesbians in your life (laughs) I certainly will see you next time on Buffy Boys Buffy Boys Boys see ya